Hi there, and welcome to a brief presentation on the Bonneville Flood. The Bonneville Flood is this amazing geologic story uh, that took place about 17,000 to 18,000 years ago uh, in the Western United States. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of good information to the general public that's available. And so I thought I'd put together a very simple presentation with some simple graphics and pictures, uh, a little bit of Google Earth fly through to explain the complete story or as much as I can relate to you about the Bonneville Flood. It's really quite a remarkable tale of, and it really has shaped the, the landscape that we have uh, throughout much of not only um, <clears throat> northern Utah, but also southern Idaho and even beyond. And so again, this is this mega flood, this huge uh, catastrophic flooding event that occurred uh, again, 17 to 18,000 years ago. And the story of the Bonneville Flood really begins with the story of a lake. And this lake is called Lake Bonneville. So this area of the Western United States, uh, the very southern edge of, edge of Idaho, uh, western Utah, much of Nevada, southeastern Oregon, and a little bit of California, is all an area called the Great Basin. And the Great Basin is interesting because it doesn't have any natural outlets to the ocean. All the water that falls there stays in those basins between those mountain ranges. There's no river system that connects this area out to the ocean like we see in many other areas. So this is what we call an enclosed or closed basin. And about uh, 30 to 20,000 years ago, um, the climate was much cooler and wetter than it is today. And so this region actually formed a series of large freshwater lakes uh, in these basins between the mountain ranges. And the largest of all these lakes, one as big as one of the Great Lakes today, was Lake Bonneville, which actually stretched into Nevada, uh, into southwestern Utah, and northward into Idaho. Uh, these lakes in this basin, what we call pluvial lakes, they would have fluctuated in terms of their size with temperature and precipitation patterns. So for example, if there was uh, higher amounts of rainfall and snow melt, uh, then the lake levels would rise. If you if you combine that also with cooler temperatures, so there's less evaporation, then they would rise maybe even more so. Other periods of time when maybe the precipitation uh, wasn't as generous or the climate was warmer, the lakes would drop a little bit. So the, t the present day Great Salt Lake, you can see there's a few remnants of these lakes today. There's Utah Lake, the Great Salt Lake, uh, a couple lakes in Nevada, and in southeastern Oregon and California, these are just these little puddles that are left behind of this once bigger and broader system of lakes throughout uh, the western United States. Um, and how do we know these lakes were there? Well, one thing we can see when we go into these basins where these lakes existed is we see really pronounced shorelines. And so these are two images from northern Utah um, near the Great Salt Lake, but these shorelines, these benches, up on the hills and mountains around there uh, indicate the lake level uh, at other times in the past. And so the way these shorelines form is you've got this massive lake, you get weather systems that um, produce uh, strong winds and the strong the winds will actually push the water ahead of it just like waves in the ocean. And those waves will produce, um, as they come smashing into the shoreline, those waves will actually erode the rocks with quite a bit of energy and over time make a bench or, or a, a level uh, terrace, if you will. And so these shorelines actually tell us that the lake was stable at that elevation for some period of time. It had enough time at that elevation for the erosion to create those terraces or those shorelines. And so that's some of the evidence we have of Lake Bonneville. And we know that Lake Bonneville at its maximum, and that's this higher shoreline you can see in this top image here, was about 5,200 feet in elevation. Uh, the lower one here, the more prominent one, this is called the Provo level. This is about 4,800 feet. So these two shorelines are separated by about 4,800 vertical feet of elevation. And so the next part of the story um, is to look at the Bear River. The Bear River is a river system that drains off the north side of the Uinta Mountains. The Uinta Mountains here in eastern Utah are, are very large. It's the largest mountain range in Utah in terms of elevation. A large uh, mountain range uh, that trends east to west. Um, during the Pleistocene, so you know, 30, 40, 50,000 years ago, this mountain range had large glaciers in it. And so the climate was a lot cooler and a lot wetter. And this river system was pretty formidable. It had a pretty large drainage basin and you can see the path of, of the, the Bear River flowing uh, through 
Wyoming, right near the Wyoming-Utah border, up along the Wyoming-Idaho border. And then as it cuts into southeastern Idaho, this river used to flow into the Snake River. It was a tributary to the Snake River. And one interesting little fact related to that is they've actually done DNA studies on fish populations uh, in the Bear River and the Snake River and found out that they had uh, common ancestry. So these river systems are related. And so the geologists had kind of figured that out already, but some of that evidence was actually um, verified and supported by some of the bi biological studies that were done as well. So this is the Bear River uh, flowing northwestward. Um, another little river system that joins it is the Portneuf River uh, flowing past what today is the present day Pocatello, city of Pocatello, Idaho, and then into the Snake River and then out to the west, eventually joining the Columbia River. Well, an interesting event happened uh, about 50, 55,000 years ago, and that was that there was an eruption. So there's uh, this area has volcanic eruptions that occur from time to time. We can see the more recent eruptions here in the Snake River Plain at places like Craters of the Moon. But an eruption uh, about here near the town of Soda Springs uh, produced lava, and that lava actually went into the Bear River and dammed it up and diverted it. And so the Bear River, as that lava built up the land higher, the Bear River was forced to find a new path. And the rerouting of the Bear River um, after this eruption about 50 to 55,000 years ago, forced the Bear River southward. So it's kind of a crazy river. It flows north for, oh, I don't know, a good uh, 80, 90, maybe 100 miles or so. And then it does a complete 180, swings back to the south, and today it pours into the Great Salt Lake. Well, at this time, the Bear River then would have been rerouted into the Bonneville Basin, into Lake Bonneville itself. And this river, again, was a very large river at that time. And so you can imagine then the effect of this river being added to this, this lake that doesn't have an outlet. And so you can see the, the diversion of that today. And so this is what the map looks like today. The Bear River has this big swing uh, to the south, flows back to the, to the Great Salt Lake. Uh, the Portneuf River then, which was once a tributary to the Bear River, now it's kind of its own little river system that flows through Pocatello and then joins the Snake River uh, up here. So the lake was a lot higher um, at, that, at that time. So we think that this event, the rerouting of the Bear River into Lake Bonneville, was probably one of the major uh, factors in rising the lake level up. Sure, it was affected by the climate up and down, uh, but if you combine the cooler climate uh, and lower evaporation rates about 20,000 years ago with the fact that you're dumping this uh, glacially fed river into the Bonneville Basin, we think that this might have been the thing that really brought the, the river up to the point where uh, the flood occurred. And so the next part of the story is, of course, the Bonneville flood. And we aren't quite exactly sure what caused the Bonneville flood. There's, it's possible... Uh, that there was an earthquake maybe along one segment of the Wasatch Fault or maybe another fault system in southeastern Idaho uh, and that the sloshing of the water in uh, Lake Bonneville would have produced um, a, a wave that overtopped its lowest point. So we're not sure exactly what initiated it, but um, we'll take you now to Google Earth and we'll kind of look at um, exactly where the flood started. Um, but the flood began uh, southeast of Pocatello at a place called Red Rock Pass. Um, and so what happened was the lake rose to its lowest natural divide. There was kind of like a, a, a fan of sediment that had filled in, come off the adjacent mountains there, and the lake level rose up to that point there. And then possibly there was an earthquake that caused it to slosh over, or maybe the lake just kept rising to the point that it started pouring over that natural divide, um, initially not having a lot of water pouring over the lip, which would have started cutting and eroding away the sediment. But as it cut further and further down, it was able to unleash more and more of that lake water. And that essentially precipitated uh, the Bonneville flood. Um, and so we end up with this big, massive flood that comes roaring out of the Lake Bonneville Basin into Idaho. This is actually where the flood began. Uh, this is Red Rock Pass. This is looking to the south, so the water's coming out of the lake towards you. And the erosion of the, the natural divide here that was at Red Rock Pass cut the river, excuse me, cut the lake down, dropped the lake level down about 400 feet. So you've got to take this massive lake that was over a thousand feet deep at its deepest, 
um, and bring all that water through this narrow gap and drop the lake level down about 400 feet. There's all kinds of impressive numbers uh, about the Bonneville flood. We estimate that the, the peak discharge, so the, the maximum amount of water that it was releasing uh, per time per second was about a million cubic meters per second, which is about 35 million cubic feet per second. Those, those numbers probably look impressive, but to give them some context, context uh, that's about five times uh, what the flow of the Amazon River is. So just a tremendous amount of water coming out of Lake Bonneville uh, and heading into Idaho. We think that the, the flood might have lasted several weeks, maybe possibly several months. Uh, obviously, it would kind of waned maybe as it, as it dropped lower and lower. Basically, what stopped the flood was once this soft sediment and, allu and alluvial material was uh, cut through, and once the, the water reached harder resistant rock that it couldn't cut through, that essentially kind of stopped the flood. So again, about a 400 foot drop uh, going downward. And one interesting thing that we're going to look at here is we're going to kind of take the path of the Bonneville flood from Red Rock Pass and go downstream and kind of back, toggle back and forth between using Google Earth and looking at some slides and images to kind of show you uh, what it did to the landscape. And the main uh, thing to remember as we're looking at this flood is whenever the flood had to go through a narrower path, a, a smaller constriction on the landscape, that meant that the water had to increase its velocity. No different than you maybe putting your thumb over the garden hose to increase the velocity or the pressure of the water. And whenever that water or that flood water had to go through a narrower gap, um, that meant that it had a lot more energy, a lot more power, and that's where it tended to erode or chew up the landscape. It would, it would, it would move rocks, it would excavate parts of the soil and the material that was there. And in other places where the valleys were already quite a bit wider, that's where the water would spread out, it would slow down, and whatever material it was carrying, boulders, sand, whatever uh, sediment load it was carrying, that material would, would be deposited. And so as we go downstream uh, along the Snake River, following the path of the Bonneville flood, we'll see um, some alternating areas where there's intense erosion, where the landscape was uh, cut into and excavated, and other places where sediment was dumped and filled in part of that landscape. Um, and so let me switch over real quick here to Google Earth. And so here we have, um, I'm going to leave the roads on there for a second, but this is Utah, Idaho, and Wyoming here. And we're going to kind of go uh, right along Highway 91 between Preston uh, and Downey. This is more or less where uh, Red Rock Pass is, is right in this area here. So this was this was the you could imagine then the, the lake actually extending in an arm up into this valley, and this was the point of initiation for the flood. So the flood actually began here, started flowing down this creek here. This is Marsh Creek, uh, and then flowed to the north, um, kind of following the I-15 corridor today, uh, causing quite a bit of erosion here. There's actually some basalts, um, young basalts in this area here that have been eroded and kind of stripped clean. Uh, and then it joins the um, Portneuf River right here at McCammon. The Portneuf River comes out here near Lava Hot Springs. So it's following the Portneuf River out into Pocatello. Of course, as, as that water is going through these narrow valleys, again, it's moving very quickly. It's eroding. Uh, but where it's fanning out here as it's entering the Snake River Plain, that's where it deposits a lot of the, these big boulders. Um, of course, this was back before we had the, these big reservoirs here today, like American Falls Reservoir. But you can imagine uh, the water then kind of uh, moving down the Snake River, following the Snake River, um, and then we'll take the story as far as Burley right now because I want to switch back to uh, our images and show you a few of these things here. Um, and so this is Massacre Rock, so this is between Pocatello uh, and Burley. Uh, it's a state park. It's a place where the river is, um, there's some cliffs there, but the main thing here is there's quite a few deposits uh, from the Bonneville flood, these big, huge, rounded boulders of basalt, these these rocks of of uh, solidified lava that have been sort of churned. And as you look at the size of these boulders with these uh, juniper trees for scale, you get a real sense for the power of the Bonneville flood. There's there are rocks and boulders out there, um, and in some places up to 15 or 20 feet in diameter, bigger than a car, uh, maybe kind of a tiny house size or something like that. Really quite impressive. And so we'll take the story uh, as we go westward um, over here. So this is Twin Falls here, the town of Twin Falls. This is the modern path of the Snake River. Uh, the town of uh, Burley is kind of down over here, or just off the screen here, I should say. 
Um, and really, as the, as the floodwaters came into this area, it's kind of an open area. Um, there's not a lot of topography. The river is in kind of a broad uh, plain, if you will. But starting right here with the yellow arrow is this is where uh, the Snake River Canyon, which Twin Falls is somewhat famous for, um, this is where the Snake River Canyon begins. And so we start, uh, there's a canyon that begins here, kind of shallow initially, but it quickly gets deep to the point where near Twin Falls, it's uh, almost 500 feet deep. And this is important because, and I'm going to show these with some silly graphics here, but hopefully you can kind of follow along. This is important because along the path of the Bonneville Flood, this is the one significant location where the Bonneville Flood left or abandoned the Snake River path and started flowing somewhere else to some degree. Um, and so what we can see here additionally, and we'll, we'll spend some time looking at this, is you can see actually a tract of land. You can see all the agriculture going on here, all the green squares and circles where uh, farming is taking place. But then there's this big swath on the landscape where the farming is not happening. And this is because this area has no topsoil. Essentially, it's what we call a scab land. Uh, the topsoil has been completely stripped away and it's mainly solid rock through there. Um, and so what happened here, as we get back to the Bonneville flood story, is the water couldn't get through this canyon fast enough. So as all this flood water is coming in to the area around Burley, what we call the Burley Basin, it can only, it's got to wait because there's only so much water that you can have pass through uh, the beginning of the Snake River Canyon. So the water starts backing up behind this constriction, starts flooding the area around Burley, and then what happens is the water, which, you know, being kind of lazy and taking the path the least resistance, uh, starts flowing in a different path. As the water rises higher in the Burley Basin, there's a second path of water that starts to spill overland across this area here, and we call this the Eden Channel. Um, and then around Twin Falls, and we'll spend some time looking at these features here in a second, this is where the Eden Channel of the Bonneville Flood re-enters and rejoins the, this other path of the Bonneville Flood along the Snake River. What's interesting here is the Eden Channel is much wider, um, but was shallower. Um, we also estimate that 60 to 70 percent of the floodwaters went through the Eden Channel. And as that water is moving through there, maybe 30, 40 miles an hour, it's stripping away the topsoil, it's, pull, it's stripping down any, any vegetation that's in, in the way, and it's starting to cut and erode into uh, the solid rock below, especially where it starts to drop into the Snake River Canyon around Twin Falls over here. And so we'll spend a couple minutes uh, here kind of looking at the tremendous erosional features uh, right around Twin Falls. This is where some of the more spectacular uh, features from the Bonneville Flood are best exposed. Here's one more uh, diagram, a much nicer diagram than the one I put together, but this kind of shows the same thing with the Bonneville flood coming into the Burley area, um, the flooding along the Snake River, so the flood path along the Snake River, but then the secondary channel along um, this Overland Channel, what we call the Eden Channel, flowing to the north and then rejoining the Snake River Canyon and the Snake River over here near Twin Falls. Uh, you might wonder why, why this area wasn't flooded, and there's actually a couple of prominent uh, high points there, not so prominent, but subtle high points on the landscape. These are actually old shield volcanoes, and these are high enough that they were uh, not inundated by the flood water. So the flood water was occupying uh, the lowest path as it was moving to the west. So kind of a cool little um, a view there. And if we kind of go back again to Google Earth and kind of zoom in a little closer, so now we'll kind of come over here, follow that channel. We'll turn the roads off for a second because they're a little more distracting, but we can see that path of scab land, that area where the Bonneville flood uh, northward, north uh, lobe or channel rejoined the Snake River down here. And if we kind of come in here close, you can see uh, you know, this scab land type topography that we've talked about, that there's not a lot growing on it. Um, you can see the bare rock that's it's been stripped down. We'll go ahead and switch our view a little bit here so we can kind of look uh, westward along the path of the Snake River. Um, and you can imagine then this, this, this path of water, and this is in some places, I think, three or four or five miles wide, uh, moving across this landscape, again, cutting away all the topsoil, and then as it starts to drop, as it starts to flow over and lose elevation as it goes into the Snake River, that's where you get a lot more uh, downcutting 
of the water. And so it starts to form some of the familiar landmarks around the Twin Falls area, like Vineyard Lake. Uh, this here is Devil's Corral. Uh, so all these little kind of amphitheaters, these, these horseshoe-shaped canyons that are just dry, these cataracts, these were all carved out by the Bonneville Flood. Uh, so we can kind of stay here along the Snake River. Here's where at Devil's Corral. The canyon got a lot wider and a lot deeper during the Bonneville Flood. So there was already a canyon here before the Bonneville Flood. That's one, um, one kind of myth that's out there. People think that the Bonneville Flood made the Snake River Canyon, uh, and that's not true. The Snake River Canyon was already present. It was just a lot smaller. It was more shallow, not nearly as wide. And then as this w water comes through, it's just chewing up the rock. It's excavating into the, the, the basalt. It's, it's getting into the fractures, ripping out, plucking uh, big sections of cliff. That's what creates this, uh, this low area here where Durkee's Lake is today. Um, and it moves westward. It actually cuts down deep enough that it intersects a different rock type below the basalt, a rock called rhyolite. Uh, and that rhyolite's pretty resistant and actually forms Shoshone Falls. So this is the lip of Shoshone Falls. So the Bonneville Flood did create Shoshone Falls. It excavated uh, the canyon deep enough to encounter that other rock type and form Shoshone Falls. It also formed Pillar Falls, this area down here. Uh, again, if we kind of swing around to um, back looking to the north a little bit more, we can see just this scab land, this area that's just undeveloped, unfarmable, um, because it's just stripped down to solid rock. Um, really cool by the Prime Bridge is a really great uh, little kind of plunge pool bowl. So you can imagine as the water is like pouring back into the Snake River Canyon, it's swirling, just intense eddies and hydraulics and vortices that are excavating some of these incredible features here, including uh, this is Blue Lakes Alcove here. So this is a little kind of horseshoe box canyon um, that was excavated by the Bonneville Flood. And then going down a little bit further um, to Auger Falls area. So the canyon's a little wider here. Uh, and if you kind of get down on the landscape here, we can see that um, we can see there's some big boulders down here. There's actually a field of uh, boulders down at the bottom of the canyon. And these boulders were all deposited by the Bonneville Flood. So you can actually see these boulder bars um, strewn across the valley floor um, where the Bonneville Flood came through. There's actually a secondary channel over here, what we call a paleo channel, um, that was gouged out by the Bonneville Flood. The Snake River was undoubtedly kind of uh, uh, diverted a little bit from where it originally was. It might have been somewhere else in its canyon, but at, at the present time, it's over here on the north side. Um, and on and on as we go downstream. Um, but this part around Twin Falls is really quite spectacular because you get the, uh, the combined flow uh, from the floodwaters down the Snake River and the floodwaters in this Eden Channel um, combining together and just churning up and chewing up the rock and creating some of the spectacular landscapes and scenery uh, right around Twin Falls. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll um, quickly just kind of look at the map and then go back to a couple slides. So the floodwaters would have come through there, uh, down towards Buell and Hagerman. The valleys are a little bit wider there, so mainly lots of uh, deposition. Um, Pretty wide area also around Bliss and, and King Hill and Glens Ferry. So mainly big boulders being deposited there as well. Um, and then we'll kind of, we'll follow some slides here, but we'll take the story uh, to Bruno Sand Dunes. Uh, we'll go a little bit further west uh, through uh, the Swan Falls area. And then we'll end up uh, south of uh, Boise area here at a place called uh, Celebration Park. So let me switch back over to the slides and we'll kind of um, wrap up our story here with some hopefully some impressive images of uh, the Bonneville flood. So um, so here's the view from the interstate near King Hill and again you can see these big rounded boulders uh, just strewn across the landscape. We actually have a formal geologic name for these boulders. They're called melon gravels um, and the name, kind of a weird name, the name actually comes from this sign which is actually still uh, present along Old Highway 30 uh, near King Hill. Front, the front of the sign, the other side of the sign is for a gas station, um, but it's set up in this field where these all, there's all these rounded Bonneville flood uh, boulders that were deposited by the flood. 
And then someone put up this this funny sign many years ago, petrified water, watermelons, take one home to your mother-in-law. So again, that's where the name uh, Melon Gravels comes from. Um, around Bruno sand dunes, the water actually kind of swirled around in a, in a basin there um, before the dunes were created. And you can actually, in some places, in the dune field, so this kind of grayer material here is all the windblown sand from the Bruno sand dunes. But in places, you can see these lighter, more beige outcrops. And if you look at them up close, you can actually see these kind of wavy ripple marks. This is uh, where some of the water was kind of sloshing around in this basin um, during the Bonneville flood. This is where it was much broader, uh, wasn't dropping the big rocks, but was more just swirling around with silt and sand, uh, making these nice little kind of slack water deposits at, at Bruno Sand Dunes. Uh, a little further downstream at Swan Falls, we have another narrow canyon, so we, we rip apart some of those boulders along the wall, cliff walls there, and those get strewn downstream. I think this section of the Bonneville flood path has maybe some of the biggest boulders in terms of absolute size. There's actually some really large boulders around the Swan Falls area. A little bit further downstream, uh, the canyon widens out, and so a lot of those boulders ripped out of the walls at Swan Falls were deposited uh, around Celebration Park. This is a county park. Uh, south of the Boise area. Um, and what's significant about this area is that a lot of these boulders, which have this kind of dark uh, desert varnish coating on it, uh, in some places uh, ancient Native Americans actually used other hard rocks or other tools to uh, draw petroglyphs um, on the rock surfaces. So they chip away at that and draw different figures and symbols and such onto those surfaces there. Um, Here's another kind of view uh, at Celebration Park. What we can see here, as we kind of look to the, I guess that's the southwest, is you can actually see by the orientation of all these boulders which way the water was moving. So in this case, the water was moving from your left to right. And you can see a lot of the boulders are kind of uh, laid on end or kind of like dominoes, what we call imbrication, with a, a, a gentle kind of upstream side and a more steep downstream side. These things would have just been sandblasted and knocked together. That would have made them more rounded as they moved downstream. Uh, and last but not least, uh, just one of the big boulders uh, down there at Celebration Park. Um, this one's maybe like 15 feet in diameter or something like that. Just immense. So really amazing story, the Bonneville Flood. Um, a, a huge modifier of the landscapes of southern Idaho. Um, just a tremendously cool event that took place in our in our state's history and one that I just don't think is out there enough. So I'm hoping this video helps people understand and appreciate it a little bit more. So thanks for watching.